Hey guys, welcome to Talk Murder Me Podcast. My name is John. I'm sitting here with Jen and Nicole tonight. We're talking about the Skid Row Slasher. Very interesting case. I don't think too many people have covered this. If you don't know what Skid Row is and you're a Supremo or one of our supporters, we're doing the live chat right now and we're on with all our, all of our friends talking here, but I'm going through the Google Earth. I always knew what Skid Row was, but going through Google Earth really puts things in a different Is it perspective like really dilapidated so let we're gonna when actually, i think of skid row i don't know why i think of shit stains and underwear <laughs> skid mark skid row <laughs> yeah <laughs> not my underwear just in general <laughs> just to clarify well there's a lot of skid rows there's like one in vegas yeah i didn't think it I was think, like a specific place i thought it was just a term i'm pretty sure all of new mexico is considered a skid oh, row oh you stop that but Skid Row is, it's a place where derelicts go and they camp out on the streets. Ah. And California, Los Angeles is supposed to be one of the, the more friendlier ones. You know, California, they don't really kick people out to the curb. Right. However, I mean, because we had kind of a Skid Row under the bridge. Remember that? Under the... the um, the bridge in Charleston, there was that camp, huge camp. You don't remember that? Like people would drive into Charleston, and that's the first thing they would see is this huge camp of tents, homeless people. So and I don't know what happened to them. They they were evicted. I don't when know where was they. When this? Fu- when was this? Was like five years ago. And they went somewhere. They didn't kill them all. I don't know where they went. Probably to a different street. But they're no longer under the bridge. The Ravenel Bridge or the Mark Clark Bridge? My, Nicole, are you listening? Yes, I'm trying to send which, you a picture. Oh, which bridge? Wasn't under the Ravenel? I don't know. It, it was, was downtown. Question, remember when we took our pictures for the Charleston City paper and there was kind of like, not like right near where we were under the bridge, but like there was a couple of sleeping bags and stuff under... I think it's under the uh, Ravenel. All right. So this is Skid Row. Oh, 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 okay. Yes, 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 yes. This is Skid Row. Anybody on live chat been to Skid Row? This is crazy. That is actually the name of the street? Or is this just a Skid Row in Los Angeles? No, this is like the the more well-known Skid Row. There's a bunch of Skid Rows, but... Is there a Motel 6 over there? Because I, when I went to Los Angeles <laughs> and I stayed in a Motel 6, <laughs> uh, did I tell you that guy's the story about how I always want to stay in a Motel 6? Why? I don't know, because the commercials were fun. And then I actually <laughs> did stay in a Motel 6 and I got there and I was like, oh. This is Skid Row, Jen. Oh, okay. This is no, on, this is not where I stayed. This is on Google Earth. Check that shit That's out, like man. It's like on the streets. Okay. Yeah, those are t- uh, tent, like encampments. This is Skid Row. This is a current Google fucking thing. Man, Sydney should, thinks she's been there. The, Sydney did look like this. You see all the tents. Look at all these, like the tents and the homeless <sighs> that's, people. That's sad. But I remember when I was in college. Look at this shit. This is like, this isn't like back in the day. This is current. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the Google Toilet. car drove through here probably in like last year. 2022. This is updated this year. Man. So this is what's happening on Skid Row. There's just. People it's camping a commu- out. It was a community, basically, of, of homeless people, derelicts. Yeah, a lot of drunkards, uh, a lot of prostitution happens here. So this is Skid Row. This is actually is an actual thing. What part of Los Angeles is this? Is lower, it like wh- lower California? Here, let me back out. I know where Los Angeles is. I'm talking about like what part is it? West LA, North it's LA. It's right near the freaking main. It's, it's near East Hollywood. To answer your question, am. Uh, I remember when I was in college, there, shit, people were camping goes. out on the New Haven Green. It was like Occupy the Green for some sort of cause. I don't remember. Look at it was for stuff. a long time. I'm trying to remember. I, I visited my friend in Los Angeles in 2016, but I don't think I was over at this. No, area. you would have noticed if you've been over here. Well, I, 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 if it was there in 2016, I would definitely yeah, have Yeah, it's noticed. been there for, for literally since the story, which is in the 70s. So. Oh, then no, I was not. All right, guys, tonight we are going to, we're actually talking about an episode that came out from Police Story, which was a, a CSI type of it was a cop police, drama. Yeah, a police drama, what they now call procedural dramas mm. for uh, police dramas. So CSI, 
Law and Order. Law and Order. 911. The countless other ones. So it was one of those. And this one was actually really popular. And they put an episode out on November 26, 1974. The premise of the episode is a psychotic killer goes around L.A. Skid Row and knifes a bunch of derelicts. Okay. <laughs> that, that's the episode. So they put that out on November 26th, 1974. Four days later, a psycho killer goes on a two-month killing spree in Los Angeles Skid Row killing derelicts. Oh, no. <laughs> I mean, literally pick this up from the, the freaking show. Right? That's what we're talking about. This is the uh, Skid Row slasher. If you want to read this, uh, this is, just read the, the headline here. Third Skid Row Man's Throat Cut. TV script may be clue. So I need to say right now, if you're on live chat, you saw Skid Row, you probably know what Skid Row is. If someone dies there or gets murdered, it's more of a like who cares type of thing, Mm -hmm. right? Let's be honest. The third victim here, the third homicide was only reported because of the link to the TV show. That it would have been at least seven or eight homicides before anyone would have taken notice or gave a shit. And that's not just LA, that's just society in general, man. You know what I'm saying? Like a bunch of homeless people getting knifed, like, you know, oh, stop the presses, right? But the reason that this story is even known is because it happened four days after an episode featuring the exact same plot has taken place, right? That's the reason people care. Just saying. And in fact, like the first few murders, they weren't even covered in the paper. It was only the third one that some reporter said, hey, these, this reminds me of a show I watched four days ago about this same thing. The Skid Row Slasher, what we're talking about tonight, this story goes over a two-month period. It's a spree killer, basically. It actually follows the plot of the episode four days after it starts. And for two months, the late December 1974 to early 1975, he kills at least nine people during that two-month spree. I don't know. You guys don't think that's crazy that it's... uh... It's int- it, <laughs> so mean, he's coming up with this from the show. Fourth derelict on Skid Row found slain with throat cut. Police say killing bears distinctive characteristics of three previous murders, but declined to elaborate. That's from the Fresno Bee, December 12th, 1974. We're actually starting on the first murder day. This was December 1st, 1974. This is on Skid Row. And a little bit about the the episode, not the actual killings, but the episode featured the killer who himself was a derelict. He was homeless, unemployed, and he would kill to symbolically punish himself for his own failure. So he Hmm. was killing others, which in his mind was killing himself every time he did that because he was so... He was so he he hated his failure type of thing. That was the premise of the sh- that episode. Got it. Yeah. But but oh, is that in the episode or you're talking about the actual the killer? the episode? Okay. Okay. Because I got, was like, how did he? How, but if it, okay, go on. But what followed was the two month murder spree and one of the largest manhunts since Charles Manson. Why there was a large manhunt is only because of the TV show caused uh, a national ruckus. Crisis, yeah. In the papers. Because, I mean, it's sensational, right? Oh, my God, there's a killer emulating a TV show? Fucking crazy. Because otherwise, who would care? You know what I'm saying? Type of thing. It, it wouldn't even... None of these murders would even have made the paper. I promise you that. So, we're going to talk about the Skid Row Slasher tonight. So, who was killing these homeless people? One reporter says that, describing Skid Row, quote, death is as common as the empty bottles, mm. end quote. I'm actually starting with the third victim tonight, Arthur Dahlsteed. He's the third victim. You look up his name, you don't see anything but 
the fact that he was a victim, but I knew there was probably something more to his story. So I wanted to try to figure out, you know, who is this guy? How did he end up here? Is he just some homeless Yahoo or whatever? Like, how did he end up here? He was killed December 11th, 1974. This is the third victim. We don't have a picture of him. 54 years old. This man was a United States Navy veteran. Not only that, he was also a World War II POW. Mm. This is, he was a World War II POW. He was serving in the United States Navy at the time, and he was captured by a, a Japanese commando unit, and he was imprisoned in this POW camp and tortured for months in Osaka. I showed her the pictures. I, I thought I'll put them on the slide, but they were just pictures of random POWs that got caught in Japan. And do you remember what they look like? Most of them were skeletons. Ma- skeletons. Mm-hmm. Like if you think of the Jew, the Jews that um, in the concentration camps, uh, the Americans look like that. The Japanese would starve them. They would beat, beat them, kill half of them. So the fact that he survived as a POW in this, this camp is pretty incredible. But then you think about it, World War II ends. Okay. What now? He comes back and he drowns his sorrows and his guilts of war and his all his flashbacks and all that shit, the PTSD. He finds comfort in the bottle. He ends up on Skid Row. That's how he came from. Originally from Tennessee. Now he's a drunkard. Skid Row. Just like probably many, many of the veterans. Anyway, a friend found him dead on the doorway at an alley of Fifth and Town Avenue. This was on Skid Row. All this is right there. If you go off the street a little bit, there's, you know, kind of... I, I'm not from the city, guys, so I'm going to try to explain this. But a big city, you go up the stairs to, like, someone's house. Mm-hmm. If you go down the, the rough neighborhood, sometimes you see the the homeless sleeping there. On the stoops? On the st- stoops, is that what they're called? The stairs? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so... Stoop kid doesn't leave the stoop. Yes, that's not what you're yep. thinking. Mm-hmm. So he was sleeping there, and he would he would be transient. So he would sleep here one night, and he would sleep under the library one night and under this bridge or whatever. So he'd move around. A friend found him. Another man like him down on his luck found him, went to check on him. And he was still kind of wrapped up in the sleeping bag. But he noticed a large amount of blood dripping down the stairs. And from the Los Angeles Times, December 12th, 1974, quote, this is about the, the friend. The acquaintance stumbled back to the street, waved down a passing motorcycle policeman and led him to the body. The man's throat had been slashed from ear to ear, end quote. He was attacked as he slept. One paper I saw described it as the blood dripping down the stairs like a tipped-over paint bucket. It was so much blood just dripping down there. And it was cold, too, so it was all coagulated and stuff. Mm. And that's how he went out. POW had survived that Mm. unsurvivable, insurmountable, I mean, starved to death, skeleton when when he was finally rescued, hopelessness most of his comrades died survived all that couldn't get a job like many of the vets in world war ii didn't want to get a job maybe in some cases you know used alcohol ended up on skid row that's that's his life and that's how he ended up 1974 december 12th dead on the steps so that was the third murder there's two others before that Mm. but that was the last victim. No, no, no. He's killed nine oh. at least. We're okay. going to go through all of them. This was the third. Sorry, but this got- is the, the reason I started with a third is because that's when the papers gave a shit. Right. That's when the reporter's like, wait a minute. What the fuck? This just happened on TV. Someone's doing this in real life. Did someone on the television production know that this was happening or and, and write a story about it or did. It was it aired first and the person was a copycat killer. No, they Mm. they did. I did. That is a good question. I did see them 
because they always interview the directors and stuff. And it's got to be kind of surreal. I remember in that one case, or that one case we did with the Laughing Jack, I think it was, or yeah. one of those creepy pasta cases mm-hmm. where they interviewed the, the creator. And it was a stabbing man, a stabbing, a slender man. Slender man. Yep. Mm-hmm. And they were like, do you know your story that you wrote for this website, Creepypasta, resulted in the stabbing and death of yada, yada, yada. And, I mean, he was saddened. I think I, we read that quote, but it's just kind of surreal to know that you, what you did, did that. Even, it was unintentional, obviously. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you could tell the same with the directors. Obviously, it's no fault of their own. And... You know, people take creative liberties and like, yeah, I mean, I'm sure it happens now with the people watch CSI is like or snapped or oh whatever. My gosh, or, all kinds of different TV shows about murder. Yeah, all kinds of podcasts. Gives idea. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So that's why I started with the third murder. The first murder happened December 1st, 1974. Charles Jackson, Louisiana. Same shit. Derelict. No photo. You know. Throat slashed ear to ear. He was actually found at the public library. Oh. On Skid Row. If you keep going down there, you'll see a public library. We can go to Google Earth if you want. But if you want to read this, Nikwiz. Faint bloody footprints on the sidewalk suggested a possible frantic attempt by the victim to escape the savage attack, only to be dragged in under the trees and left to die. He was at the, the library. When I was on Google Earth looking at the library, just like many libraries you see, you see the shrubs that surround it, you know, in the big cities. In those shrubs, these derelicts could find some sort of warmth because the wind is being blocked by the trees and stuff like that. And maybe the mulch is warm. So he was sleeping in there. And as you read, he he was pulled back under the trees Kind of thing. So I guess he tried to, he woke up because this killer kills when you're sleeping. And I guess it's at night. So maybe sometimes you think they're sleeping and they're not. Mm -hmm. But most cases on these murders, he killed while they were sleeping. So he probably woke up or whatever and tried to leave. And then he was drugged back. So, and then that almost risks the question is, is it like a, did the killer think that they were a type of Robin Hood? Character. Yeah, so that's all. That's also a, that's like the Jack the Ripper question. Like, is he doing the a good thing for society by killing? Um, Not necessarily for society, but like, is, does he think he's doing good for the derelict who's struggling and down hmm. on his luck? And 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 maybe you know, but you don't know it. it the, it's terrible because you don't know each person's story. Maybe they're you know. But I think ma- maybe he, there's a mental like I think I'm doing something good. Right, because, you know, they're having a terrible life, they're struggling, they're down on their luck, but you never know. The next morning they might have an interview that's going to change their life. Like, obviously, you don't, like, moral, you don't kill anyone. But but is it is it a Robin Hood type, mm-hmm. I think I'm doing good by this person, or is it for society, or is it for just because they're... There's a television show. Yeah. I, I think the Green River Killer once said that he thought he was doing a good thing by killing prostitutes. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like, okay. Anyway, the second murder, not much known about him. I barely got his name. 47-year-old, December 8th, Moses Yakinak. You want to take a guess where that name is from? Yakinak. Poland. No, I mean, I wouldn't know either. He was described in the newspaper as an Eskimo from Alaska. I was. That was my second guess. Now, it makes sense now, yak and knack. It kind of sounds eskimo but I wouldn't have guessed it. He was found... There's rumors on part Eskimo. Our, my family. What do you mean mm-hmm. fucking rumors? Mm-hmm. <laughs> do you know what Eskimo is? There's no yes. way. Yes. Es- a real Eskimo has no contact with normal... My French-Canadian side. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We're Eskimos. Apparently. It's a rumor. We I haven't done the 23 and Me to really tell, but my grandmother uh, on my... Father's side, Meme. I'm just telling you, she like barely had any gray hair into her 90s. Oh, so yeah, that does make her an Eskimo. No, it's just like her part of her <laughs> her fuck? traits. You know, Hitler was a Rothschild. Oh, God. 
I know. Okay. Is it bad that like <laughs> I don't want my DNA to? I, like, I will never probably submit a twenty three and Me, but, but I want to know. <laughs> I do want to know. I my, want to know. My like, sister maybe, did it. Like so my mom, I'm maybe, or my sister. I don't. My know. My DNA is all over every state in this nation, <laughs> <laughs> and every rest stop. <laughs> and every glory hole gross 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 <laughs> <laughs> glory hole you're telling me you went to every single rest stop in the united states where do you think those glorious holes come from i drill them out back Ew. in the back in the 60s and 70s before he was born but it, this is when he re so he before he reincarnated into who, who, himself mm. got it got it yeah so i had the smaller ones you know <laughs> <laughs> a pencil thin mustache, if you will. So, I wish I had a pencil thin mustache. Once the sixth and seventh, and I one, can solve some mysteries too. Once the, has anyone heard of this one? The story. Uh, let's find out. Has anyone heard of the story? Everyone's gonna say yes. I want to tell you, there is more than one Skid Row slasher. Okay, mm. I found out. I need to finish my Lizzie Borden story. Yeah, I was. I've been wanting to do that story, but I'm like, well, maybe Jim will do it by ex- episode like 500 or 600. Shut up. Do you want me to do it, or do you want to do it? Do you want to do it, or do you want me to do it? Well, I mean, it would be good for you know uh, search engine views since it is so popular. But if you want to do it eventually, maybe once. <laughs> Never mind. I'm being- <laughs> no, I'm. I'm being. I'm. Be- I'm. I am being like genuine. Do you want to cover the story, or do yeah. you want me to cover the story, Jen? I know you're trying to push off the story. No, I'm not trying to push off the story. I literally had this conversation last night. I was like, I need to do my Lizzie Borden story. With who? With Tara. I'm going to ask Tara. Go ahead. You can ask her. Was it in English or Greek? She was in my sorority. (laughs) It was an English conversation, though. I'm serious. Do you want me to cover it or do you want to cover it? Jen's going to cover it. (laughs) Because I have attempted to cover my own stories. Yeah, it's fucking hard, isn't it? It is hard. I didn't say it was easy. That's why it's been taking me so long. Because I need to, not only do I need to know <laughs> all of the facts, I need to have a PowerPoint so that I can show the audience. You don't have to have PowerPoint. Just keep, I just use PowerPoint for the pictures. That's what I'm saying. I need to put together a PowerPoint so I can organize my thoughts and the pictures. Lauren says he thinks Jen should give it a go. When do you, give me a deadline. Tuesday. <laughs> In three days, Tuesday. I have an well. I have He's an assignment joking. due for my CDF class on Monday, so maybe Thursday. I ain't counting on it, Jen. I mean, do if you, want, you surprise me, we'll do the story. Do but you, I'm gonna also have stories planned do out. You want, <laughs> do you want me to have it done next week? No, or the week after, Jen? I don't know, man. No, I'm serious. Don't me, don't rush it. Give me a deadline. No, uh, what's your like? You need to plan that based on your own. Why, schedule. why don't you tell the world when it's going to be out? Like this podcast, be like on this date, this episode is going to be out, and then when you if you miss it, then you're gonna feel bad. Okay, um, <laughs> but don't. If you want to wait until the like school year's over, don't get that's too fine. overconfident, man. Because uh, I no, it's hot. Like don't over, no, no, don't the, over. The reason I can commit. do three stories is because I've been doing it for four fucking years. Like there's, you just you know, like I know how to put these stories together, kind of thing. It's probably going to be something over the summer, realistically. That's fine, but I don't want to keep pushing it off either. Yeah, because I, I mean, people do request that story. All right, <laughs> how about you give it like uh, Memorial April break? Day. April April break. I'll work on it during spring break well, in April or or like so after by Memorial, Memorial Day. By Memorial Day, we'll have All right. it. Two thousand twenty two two. This year, this year, <laughs> we will have it by Memorial Day. I'm going to work on that during and slash before April break. BC or shut up <laughs> before Common Era. What is the other one? What else? BC. Did, did other people say if they want me to do it or John to do it? Because if they don't, if they if the people want John to do it, then he can have it. I don't. No, they don't want me to do it. They don't want me to do it. I'm these. hearing Jen. So <laughs> only one. I'm hearing Jen. Okay. So after the sixth or seventh murder, which we're going to get into, there was the biggest manhunt since Charles Manson. Basically, the LAPD and the surrounding count police counties had to do something. They had to put something together, not because anyone cared, but because so many papers were covering this across the nation. 
as they were like watching police story was huge. So it's like watching that episode and then reading about it playing out. It's, you know, they wanted to hear about, Oh, like what happens next? Like how closely tied to it, the murder is it like, is the guy a derelict himself? Like in the show, was he symbolically killing? Like people wanted to know that. And that's why the police were like, well, fuck, this has got to be a big manhunt. You'll see that they kind of screwed o- uh, screwed around at first. Even when it got big, they put together this uh, slasher squad. And then the, the guy, the slasher started killing more and more in quicker succession. So then they're like, fuck, okay, we'll do a task force. And that's when the money comes in, right? And the, 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 the whole resources and the FBI and, and everything. Can I just comment that slasher squad reminds me of Suicide Squad? Like the DC comics. I don't watch. Never saw it. I don't watch cartoons. All right. If you want it's to, not a cartoon. I mean, it, it was a cartoon. It was a comic book. But I mean, I was referring to the movie. But go on. If you want to read this, Nikwiz, this is from um, this is from the Berkeley Gazette, thirty first January, nineteen seventy five. One of the greatest manhunts in the city's history, search for prime suspect, described as a six foot tall, 190 pound man in his 20s with a prominent nose and stringy collared length hair of a dirty blonde color. Police had the slashers believed to be a homosexual who kills out of sexual frustration. OK, that that deputy chief is going to eat his words. <laughs> he talks a lot about how this killer is a homosexual. Mm. And I got a lot of quotes in about it. But this is what the sketch came out to be. Not only did other witnesses see this guy, but this guy has been seen by other homeless camps in the area. This man right here. So take a long look at this guy. If you want to describe this guy for our podcast listeners, it's very detailed. They got the description on both characters pretty similar, I would say. High cheekbones, long face, long hair. It kind of looks like me if I was... uh, No, it does not look like you. Your face is not that long. Nope. Yeah. Oh, you know what a, g- a good movie is that, that has Bradley Cooper in it that we watched? What was that movie called? Nightmare Alley. Yes. Yeah. It was really good. Oh, my I gosh. Know. I saw that. What do you think Creepy. of the end? Uh, don't ruin the ending, but what do you think I of it? I honestly, at the beginning, was like, this is probably going to... I, I Because at the beginning, with that character that he becomes at the end... Then, yeah. The character at the beginning, yeah. I was like, "Did I, is that him as the actor? Like, I thought it was like him and him oh, seeing oh, himself. So um, I, got a new, I kind of expected it. I got a new respect for Bradley Cooper. I don't know. He, um, he did good in it. You know what else? What else I watched this past week? Hmm. Memento. That's a crazy <gasps> movie. That's so I've good. So it's, it's backwards. So the guy has what? Like amnesia or something? The or guy has a short term memory and, problem because he was his his wife was raped at his home and he went to go save his wife and he was like smashed into the mirror or pistol whipped and he had a traumatic brain injury so he can't form new memories so he would he had tattoos himself but the whole story plays backwards it's really hard to follow but it's really good it's a lot of flashbacks yeah it's backward it, it's very very well done and it's it is really good it's really good i think it, i don't i think it's on my 100 movie scratch off i have to go check all but. right so jen if you're uh in the lapd and you want to catch the skid row slasher how would you do it um, I would have a stakeout with coffee and donuts and I would try to watch <laughs> what is going on. I'm not, that's you not like call. a police Good joke. Call. Yes. <laughs> that's not a police joke. I'm just saying like, you need to have coffee at, at, at a stakeout because you got to stay up and watch. And I mean, Dunkin' Donuts is like, you got to dunk donuts and coffee. Well, but like I would, I, I honestly, I would try to observe at different points of the day, start at nighttime and, you know, kind of your focus it's hard because you know you're assuming that other crimes are going on such as robbery or prostitution but you have to focus on what you're excuse me you have to focus on you know the crime that you're looking for i would assume i'm not a police officer so this is just all speculation um but yeah you you want to observe the area Sydney says, play homeless. There you go, Sydney. <laughs> I was, I was waiting. Undercover cop? Yeah, or like what I like to call Lieutenant Dangle It. Remember? <laughs> yeah. Rena and I yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, what happens? But seriously, though, but, but what if you are an undercover and then like someone tries to, well, I guess you're trained well, to you like, have, hand-to-hand combat, but like, you have, like weapons, probably. Yeah, so this is what they did. 
they they Sydney's right on. They dress as derelicts themselves, and they went undercover. And they did that in the um, last case that we've covered. That police did that was the the forty four caliber killer, mm. right? But if you want to read this, this is uh, how they would do it. Huge manhunt for Skid Row slasher. Police disguised as derelicts fanned out into the dirty streets Thursday, some lying in wait in dingy hotel rooms, others haunting the all-night cafes and alleys where frightened men sought solace in bottles of cheap wine. Okay, this is from the... Like Boone's, <laughs> Boone's wine? This is from the Berkeley Gazette right here. The police walk by... All night porno theaters, bars, flop houses, greasy spoons, sex book stores, pinball parlors, seedy hotels. What's a flop house? <laughs> a flop house? <laughs> Do you want to know? Is that like an IHOP? Is that a, yeah, what is that? I feel like it's IHOP. I think it's like a place where you can like flop flop your wiener. <laughs> I mean what is a pinball parlor? Like that's like an arcade <laughs> hall. Like the in the seventies, like the pinball was the, uh, was a thing. Like remember the Who song? I He's was a just pinball yeah. wizard. Oh yeah, na, I fucking na, hate na. the Who. All right. Okay. Well. So you hate anyway. the Beatles also, so you clearly don't have a great so, taste uh, in music. Did, wait, but what's a flop house? I don't, I don't know what a flop house is. Look at. I look think up. it's like a almost like a um, like a brothel, but for men maybe. I don't know. This is what? also a all guess. brothels are for men. What the no, fuck? no no I think men to men is what she's oh. saying. No, like I meant like wings. men to women. I don't know. It could be oh. anything. Who knows? Can you Google it? Hey Siri. Ah uh, no. Hey Siri. We don't have such things in this house. All right. So, however, this caused the slasher to focus more indoors and not on the street. And did, not on I the street. I did streets. ask the so, figure group. He, <laughs> here's what's happening, guys. Four people he slayed on the streets Ooh. while they were sleeping. Pushed some of them, kind of threw them back under the library steps. Killed one on the steps, as you saw. But now, police are dressing as derelicts and this is a paper from the time of this happening so if the slasher has access to papers he can see what they're doing the police are dressing as i'm thinking of that guy of the arena and i with the roller skates <laughs> what's his name dangle no not dangle the um the one that's always like prostituting himself. I oh, I know. a flop house is a home is like a homeless shelter you have a place to flop Oh, oh, there you go. So, okay, so I was wrong. Pol- these under- I'll admit it. I don't care. These undercover cops are now on the streets, and where does that put the slasher? Not on the streets, because he's he don't want to get caught. He ain't stupid. So he starts going to these seedy hotels where normally the population of these down and outers in these is kind of these um, hotels that you you can rent like a. Like a by the hour type place? No, not by the hour necessarily, but you can rent a room. For a week or whatever. For a week, yeah. Real seedy, shady hotels. Like the Motel 6 I stayed in? No one would, none of the people in that level, low level of society, which he is killing, was worried if they lived in a hotel room. However, the next three murders he would commit would be committed in such a quick succession remember it's only a two month murder spree three men killed in quick succession in their motel room where they thought that they were safe because they were under the protection of a roof right but now this slasher is going into the hotels that wasn't on the tv episode so he's kind of taking it up a notch right so now now is when you start to see the police giving a shit and society giving a shit because they're like, okay, he started with the under the bridge derelicts, but now he's in the cheap hotels. It seems like he may be rising. And up he's the he's social, not following the script either. Yeah, it seems like he may be going up the social ladder, but no, he's still killing unemployed and winos or whatever. So. But eventually, he does go up the social ladder. And, and I'll tell you, before we go any further, I'll tell you which actor, which Hollywood actor, nearly escaped death from the Skid Row slasher. Who? I'm going to tell you at the end. It's like a clickbait shit. Oh. 
I'll tell you which one he broke into the home of, and this guy barely escaped. Very famous actor in he in East Hollywood. So this guy, this Skid Row slasher, is raising or he is climbing the social ladder, and that's when police are like, "Fuck, we gotta do something." Because what if he kills someone of wealth? What mm-hmm. if he kills a Hollywood oh. actor or, or actress? That ain't gonna be good. Anyway, one drifter would tell a reporter about if he was scared quote it don't worry me i know i'm doing god's will he isn't gonna let nothing happen to me however you gotta remember that the killer is killing these residents while they're sleeping the police chief deputy that we're going to talk about here in a second puts out a press release and says that this skid row slasher who is now unknown quote is a warped homosexual who hated his father a psychotic who hates homosexuals, maybe even a woman with some bizarre motive. So he is a warped, he says he's a warped hom- homosexual that hated his father. It, this isn't the FBI profiling. This is the deputy chief making shit guessing. <laughs> I mean, you know, it just doesn't look well. I don't think at least. No, a, a it one, has not aged well. One part of the MO that's very important for this killer is everybody found from the first to the POW vet to the ones that we're going to talk about. Every one of them were found with the shoes off, removed, completely clothed, shoes off. So that they wouldn't float to the water? (laughs) If it flooded like a skid row flooded? No, never mind. I'm (laughs) making a reference to the... Reference to the the yeah last I know what story. The shoes were pointed, dress right dress towards the victim, which is crazy. There was one other thing too that stuck out. All nine slasher victims were killed in the same distinctive manner, with their throats slit from ear to ear, clear to the spine. Some, but not all, of the killings appeared to be ritualistic. There were other distinctive characteristics, such as the removal of a victim's shoes and placement of them toes first towards the feet of the slain man. There's not many photos, guys, but I I found this photo on one of the papers here. You can't really see what's going on, but this is the detective. And see some chalk on the ground. Yeah. So he's chalking the ground right there. You see that. Mm hmm. And it says, uh, Officer Kent McDonald uses chalk to mark blood spots and footprints of site of latest slasher murder body of victim was found on west side of the L.A. library. There was one other thing that he did that didn't go with the script. The shoes didn't go with the script and this didn't go with the script. Well, there's two other things, but we'll talk about the other one later. This guy took salt and all the victims. This was the case. And he poured salt, like, you know, the salt, Epsom kosher salt. salt. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Kosher with the girl and the, yeah. yeah. Morton salt. Morton mm-hmm. salt. Yeah. He took salt and he outlined the body. Oh, that's like a Wiccan thing. Hmm. I didn't I think. know that. So I was thinking that was like what he's doing here. Or the like chalk. a Satanist you thing. You know how, like, a police, or something. Yeah. You know how the police chalk the body? Yeah. Well, this guy, instead of chalk, used salt. I don't know. I, no or one no, knows. it's protect it from evil spirits. I think salt has, if you think about. Oh, I remember like that movie with Nicole Kidman and uh, was it Sandra Bullock? Mm hmm. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yep. Didn't they do like salt with something? Probably. But I mean, I think, I think that, that I think that's a Wiccan thing. All right. Let's talk about the locations a little bit. I could be wrong. though. The, the first four killed Skid Row derelicts. The fifth, who was a derelict, lived in a cheap hotel. The sixth was also a derelict who lived in a modest apartment. Okay. Modest apartment. The sixth was also the first one who was not unemployed. So he's like escalating in social status. Exactly. That's the point. That's why they, they started up in the shit. They're like, oh shit, they're actually... A- Killing, like, important people now. Almost all victims are small, weak, middle-aged, crippled, seriously ill, drunk, or otherwise helpless. And for some reason, I, I don't know why, he would only strike on Wednesday or weekends. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. Now, the detective, Deputy Chief George Beck, had a lot to say about this guy's sexual preference. He said that he was, quote, a sexual 
sexually impotent coward who hides in the dark and preys on weaklings and cripples. This guy's a jackal, venting his own feelings of worthlessness on hapless derelicts and down and outers. And also that he's some loner, some guy who probably lives like a hermit and only creeps out of his hole to commit these horrible crimes. And that there are strong implications in these killings of his sexual of his sexual impotence and his feelings of inadequacy, end quote. None of that makes any sense. The guy, I mean, there's no, you know, like, why would you think this guy is gay? I, I'm so confused. Anyway, it's just crazy how, like, narrow fucking tunnel vision this guy was. He was like, this guy hates his father. Look for that. Who hates his father? It's like, what the fuck? What does that even mean? <laughs> anyway, there was also one other thing that we got to get through. This is... You ain't going to believe this, but I'll show you the, the, the sources where I pulled this from. The Skid Row Slasher did something that even the directors of the police story and even nowadays couldn't even think of. <laughs> the throats of the slasher victims were cut from ear to ear through to the spine. Investigators said the killings had a ritualistic overtone with evidence that the attacker drank the blood of his victims. Bloody glasses were found at two killing scenes. The shoes of the dead were removed and placed facing them, authorities said, and there was salt sprinkled around, creating a bloody mosaic. He's drinking the blood. It's a, it, it, yeah, this is some sort of rich, it's some sort of ritual. But is it is it though? Because this happened four days after that story came out. He obviously saw that episode. I mean, is that just a coincidence? Well, maybe they were. Maybe maybe the. The the suspect was planning to planning some sort of attack or or plan, tr- trying to plan how who to carry out his ritual on, and then he saw the TV episode and was like, "Oh, that's a good idea. I can just use people who um, who many people think don't matter to society." What Nicole read was from the Spokesman Review, thirtieth December, nineteen seventy six. Let's talk about the mo change. Serial killers. Sometimes do this, and I like to think of it like anything else. When you start something new, you like to change, like a hobby or something. You always change things around. However, when someone's been doing it a long time and then suddenly change their MO, it can throw police off. The MO change is the climbing of the social ladder. Started Skid Row, then goes to CD hotels, then modern apartments, the sixth victim was a truck driver named Tex Shannon. He was found dead in his hotel room. He had locks on the door. One victim I saw had five locks on the door. Yikes. And he was still slashed from ear to ear mm. on his bed when police found him. Five locks. Tex Shannon actually had a gun. Mm. Somehow this guy is sneaking in when they're sleeping and wow. slitting them so deep that it's actually chipping the spine. Ugh. Like, what the fuck? What kind of hatred does this guy have? Who the fuck is That's doing this? It's just intense. And he's killing people with no money. It's not robbery. What is he going to get? He's just Fucking like nothing? doing it for fun. The seventh victim was actually on the fifth floor at the Barclay Hotel. And this is this is one of the rooms right here. I mean, you, look at this. That's that that's where he the ninth question the the ninth victim. But look look at the hotel room he's in. Mm. That's a nice freaking building, dude. Yeah. That ain't no Skid Row bullshit. That's some nice shit right there. So they're definitely, the police are definitely stepping it up. The eighth victim, George Frias, he was 45, employed. He worked as a secretary for Hilton Hotels. From the Spokane Daily Chronicle, quote, the, and I love this quote, quote, the killer had moved out of Skid Row and nobody could feel safe. You didn't have to be a bum to get your throat cut. The ninth victim, he killed his eighth and ninth victim within hours of each other. Wow. <laughs> I know. Crazy, right? The ninth victim, Clyde C. Hay, was an employee of the National Cash Register Company. And he was that guy that is in that apartment right there. He was found dead in his apartment, bachelor apartment in East Hollywood. His throat cut from ear to ear. Half a mile away, they found the eighth victim. They actually found the eighth victim after the ninth victims they were killed so closely so who is this guy let's talk about the arrest right quick 
because they they did find someone that let's just say matched the bill. Remember? Do you remember the? Do you remember what the sketch sketch looks like? Yeah, he had long hair, long yeah. face, high cheekbones, blondish hair. This is a sketch. Mm-hmm. Early February, Hollywood Hills. A man who you're about to see, a Von Oren Greenwood, 31 year old man, drifter, criminal, has been in the system, drifting around place to place, homeless, if you will, was caught breaking into a Hollywood Hills home, very expensive home, very expensive. This home was owned by two men, William Graham, 36, and Kenneth Ricker, 22. This man breaks in the home attempting to rob. Mm -hmm. He has a knife. And more importantly, he has a hatchet. Oh, no. A hatchet with him. Which, remember, wasn't used in any of the murders. And robbery wasn't a thing. He breaks into Hollywood Hills home. He attempts to steal things. He's caught red-handed when these guys wake up. There's a struggle. He attacks one of them. They both survive. However, this guy, and I'm going to read this right here. Quote, the intruder carried a knife and a hatchet. In the struggle, Graham crashed through a plate glass window into a nearby residence. Now, that residence across the street they basically throw him out this glass window like in the movies. He's still got the hatchet across the street. He's running. He runs into the other home because the police sirens are coming down the neighborhood. This is Hollywood Hills. Like you, you can like jump off the freaking go down the hill or up the hill. Or you can go through someone's house and kind of hide out. And a lot of the houses are, you know, empty because these actors have fucking 10 houses or whatever. So he runs into the house across the street. Luckily, the man who wasn't home at the time, who owned the house. He wasn't home, but he could have been killed. That man was Burt Reynolds. Oh. He breaks into Burt Reynolds' home. Snap. Fucking Burt Reynolds, man. Rest in peace. Breaks into Burt Reynolds' home, quote, dodging 10 bullets fired at him by pursuing policemen. They actually, (laughs) 10 bullets is what he said. They arrest this guy, and if you look at the sketch here, you can see the similarities. It's actually striking resem- resemblance. So this is the sketch, the initial sketch. I'm going to fast forward here. And this is who they arrest. Oh, my God. <laughs> Jesus Christ. That is totally not <laughs> what the sketch looks like. Uh, I don't think they got the right guy. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Jesus Christ. Oh, oh, okay. I see. I see it now. <laughs> this, I see it now. Yep. This guy looks nothing like him. Actually, this Holy is a, shit. a better picture. <laughs> that is probably not the same guy. <laughs> that's definitely not the same guy. <laughs> well, how would they like assume that that's the same guy? Because no, he didn't actually kill someone in this pursuit. Correct? No, and so he there was, was he no was like also markings. robbing somebody. He was also robbing. There was no ear to ear. There was no drinking of blood. And there he had was a fucking no... hatchet. Which, yeah, is different from the murder weapon. There so, was no re- right dress, right dress of the shoes. They actually, after this incident, they sent him to Folsom prison. Fols- Folsom, Johnny Cash's mm-hmm. prison. Yeah. They sent him to Folsom prison, and then he served there a month, one month. And then they were like, you know what? We haven't had a slasher victim in a month. <laughs> Let's look at this guy. <laughs> basically that's how they did it okay that- i'm pretty sure that that's like not how you're supposed to associate somebody with nine other murders he was already serving 32 years to life in prison for what he had done in Jeez. hollywood hills i know right seems really i mean strict. he broke into yeah. burt reynolds home man yeah but not like he that's the he i was- mean technically non-violent no, but he attacked someone with a hatchet. True, true, true. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. It could be so. like an attempted murder. Yeah. They arrested this guy again once they linked him to the murders. And the only evidence they had, besides obviously a confession, but <laughs> what the fuck does that mean? 
I mean, is this guy drinking blood? But <laughs> detectives <laughs> arrested him anyway. Yeah, it says uh, Von Greenwood bore no resemblance to the description police issued of the Skid Row Slasher. <laughs> this guy looks nothing like him. Every, all the homeless and the people there gave the fucking sketches, you know? Nothing like him. Anyway, so uh, this guy, they, they convicted him. A uh, jury of 12, the only evidence they had was a bloody footprint that an expert said was the same as one of his shoes. <laughs> wow. So he was charged with all nine murders and he was arrested February 3rd, 1975 in Hollywood Hills. And he, that's pretty much it. Actually, he just died in 2020. Hmm. Wow. And that's it. That's a Von Greenwood, Von Oren Greenwood. The judge said, quote, it is fairly evident that he suffers from some inner drive which compels him to kill, not to accomplish robbery, because most of those murdered who were rendered unconscious are defenseless, defenseless before having their throats cut, end quote. So we got our guy. We got our guy. <sighs> <laughs> Fucking completely not the guy. What the fuck? I mean, even the papers are like, dude, what? <laughs> I know. They're like, but they arrested him anyway. It's uh, wow. I mean, he, uh, I, wow. Not to say that like police sketches are always <laughs> accurate, but he was the the murderer was spotted like ha- had yeah, eyewitnesses. We've done these cases before, man. It's like okay, you're gonna spend the rest of your life in prison anyway. You better play along, type of shit. You know what I'm saying? Type. I mean, I, that's speculation, guys. Maybe this well, fucking dude did it. Fuck, I don't know. Maybe he did it. Maybe. If, if he did it, I'm telling you right now that that is a completely di- different MO. I mean, you go from a knife, cutting throats ear to ear, not robbing anything, to bringing a hatchet, trying to rob something. And you, I mean, the, ske- the sketch is fucking complete, <laughs> completely fucking funny. I mean, he was already serving life in prison. I'm just saying, man, it'd be too easy to. Yeah, Lawrence says racial profiling at its finest, <laughs> just, right there. This is L- no this shit. is also LAPD, and LAPD does not have the best track record with uh, any any mm. racial <laughs> racial uh, doings. There you go. <laughs> so you guys already fucking know. <laughs> That's awful. That's. I mean, it. I mean, I wonder what really happened. Like, because it just so happened that this person stopped killing around the same time. Maybe he moved. Maybe he maybe, died. Yeah. Maybe he was in prison. Fuck. Maybe it was him. But I'm saying, man, I don't know. The LAPD has had this problem before. You know, <laughs> see. The- it's not just me that didn't think this dude. Like none of the paper, none of the uh, reporters. Like no, what? yeah, they're like they're kind of like mocking the situation of yeah. like <laughs> clearly <laughs> this isn't the guy. <laughs> I mean, this guy was drinking blood and fucking all kinds of shit. <laughs> I couldn't find anything on his background. It's kind of obscured. Um, he went he went silent in prison, complete silent, no interviews, nothing, no media coverage at all, nothing. Barely even news of his death. Wow. Nothing. This is a serial killer that you you don't hear too much about ever. So it kind of, Wonder why. which is kind of interesting to me because that, you know, that's crazy. Like, why did, why was he so silent? But I'm not saying he did it or didn't do it. Honestly, if you ask me, I think they got lucky that a freaking guy stopped killing people and they had to blame someone. I mean, yeah. So. But that's just my opinion. Not saying that's real or not. All right. Well, I guess that's it. We're going to get off here, man. I'm fucking done. This is Mm. three episodes. Holy shit. That was almost almost, five hours We almost started on time. That was pretty, like, accurate. It's been almost exactly five hours. And I hope you guys like this time and format and stuff. From now on, I'm going to try to get these stories. And I don't know. I hope you guys like the stories. I'm trying to do stuff that no one's done. No one's heard of. Because I know you guys binge a lot of true crime. So, anyway, good it, story. If that's it, man, we're going to go get something to eat. I love mm-hmm. you guys on live chat. And for everyone on listening to the podcast, thank you for listening to Talk Murder Me. 
And my name is John. Until next time, good night, you lovely, lovely people.